uh, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, next um, an optimal seminar series and uh, today we are hosting uh, adam Wierman, um, a professor of computer science uh, of caltech um, a little bit uh, a few words of uh, adam's background so he received uh, all his uh, degrees from bachelor to phd uh, in computer science from carnegie mellon university and then he been a faculty with caltech starting in 2007. Uh, Adam's research uh, strives to make the network systems that govern our world sustainable and resilient. So he's uh, known for his work on uh, scheduling the operations of data centers uh, in a carbon aware manner. And he is also the uh, co-author of the book, The Fundamentals of Heavy Tales. He's a recipient of uh, numerous awards uh, in computer science uh, domain. And uh, he is also known for many papers that received uh, um, best uh, uh, papers awards. So, and at a variety of conferences across computer science, power engineering, and uh, operations research. So, uh, it's uh, very great uh, to have you, uh, Adam, uh, with us. Uh, and uh, just a few technical announcements. So, please feel free to use the chat to drop your questions, I can uh, ask them directly, Adam, or maybe we can also make it interactive and have more like a human connection. So please feel free to unmute yourself. So when relevant and ask your questions directly, All right? And um, at this point, yes, uh, the floor is yours, Adam, please. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been attending these talks off and on, so it's, it's great to get a chance to tell you what we've been working on at Caltech. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very happy to take questions during the talk. I'll stop a few times and ask, and you know, it'll be great if you, if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute uh, or put a ping in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on it. And then I'll uh, ask, I'll let you ask the question. We can talk back and forth. It makes the talk much more fun if we can do that sort of thing. Um, so today, uh, the work that I'm talking about is work that we've been doing uh, over the last, say, year and a half or two, uh, kind of a pandemic project at Caltech. Uh, and it's uh, led by my students, Miko, uh, Tanashe, and Tongshin, uh, along with some collaborators at Georgia Tech, uh, Deb and Don. Uh, and so I'll try to put their faces up for each of the theorems to let you know who was involved in which piece. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the goal of this work is really, uh, you know, not to tell you about specific power systems applications in this project, but to give you uh, an overview of what I think is a, a powerful new very general approach for uh, layering guarantees on top of uh, the use of modern AI's tools like you know, deep re reinforcement learning in the context of safety critical systems like power. Uh, and so you know, the high level uh, motivation for this project uh, is one that probably is very familiar to everybody. It's, it's that you know, there's a huge amount of excitement for using AI ML tools and things like power systems, smart grid, you know, smart transportation, smart X, uh, whatever your system is in, in terms of the smart city infrastructure that we all imagine. Uh, and the, the big question that we all face is, are these tools actually ready for use in these contexts? Uh, and I think we all kind of are hesitant about this if we're in this domain. And, uh, you know, I like this example to sort of highlight the hesitancy and the challenge of using these tools in these safety critical systems. Uh, and so this is a little bit old. It's from, you know, 2008 paper in 2018. But you know, the idea here is you take your vision system, which works very well in, you know, your vehicle at identifying stop signs, uh, and you add a few strategically paced pieces of tape, uh, and all of a sudden the vision system thinks that this stop sign looks like a speed limit sign, and it's very confusing why it would make this recognition, but it's also very bad from a safety sense if your you know, vision system is taking stop signs and converting them into speed limit signs. You don't want that in a car driving up to an intersection. Uh, and so this sort of kind of unexpected, unexplained uh, failure uh, is worrying, and you know, there's lots of embarrassing failures that all these smart systems 
uh, have faced in the last few years. And they just keep kind of cropping up in the headlines and leading to big, big outages, uh, you know, from data center type failures to uh, smart city and uh, grid type failures where, where this sort of mistake in some sort of vision or learning pipeline gets magnified into some sort of more cascading like failure. Uh, and this really highlights that, you know, maybe the in, in a sort of terse, crisp way, uh, a key, key barrier to realizing the potential of these AML tools and these smart systems, these smart city systems, is that you just can't afford to fail at scale. Uh, and in a sort of more kind of specific, tangible way, you know, the, the thing that often happens, at least in our group at Caltech, is when we're talking to companies and, you know, people are coming through and talking to us about our research, a very typical question is something of the following form where some CTO uh, has a team in their company that's, you know, trying to convince them that, you know, this AI tool can provide a big win in performance, uh, but they can't adopt it, you know, off the shelf because they're worried about failing at scaling. And so, you know, the question that they come to us with is, can, you know, I want to use this tool. How can I get guarantees on top of this tool to make it, uh, you know, make it actually something I can deploy. And, you know, a, a nice concrete application of this that, you know, I think is in an area that we've been working on a lot in our group and has been kind of over the headlines in recent years is uh, Google's team that's working on taking, you know, carbon aware scheduling into their data centers. Uh, and it, this article is from a few years ago, and I use it because they, it has this uh, nice animation uh, that Anna's team put together, where it kind of shows the, the big picture idea of, you know, you take data centers and you run them harder uh, when there's solar or wind energy available, and you migrate workloads to regions uh, where there is solar or wind available rather than running it in places where there's dirty fuel available. And so this is a very kind of simple idea that the community has been pushing for a long time and, and our group has been very involved in. Um, and it's also an idea where clearly AI ML tools could be a big win because if you're trying to predict when the renewables are available, when energy prices are low, when workloads will be, when flexible workloads will be available to be able to take advantage of this sort of thing, that seems like something that's very doable. Uh, we should be able to do that accurately. And in fact, you know, a different team within Google, within DeepMind, uh, really showed that that sort of prediction was possible uh, and that you could take DeepRL tools and, you know, deploy these things, you know, and, and sort of model these things leading to a big uh, reduction in the cooling bill and a big improvement in kind of carbon efficiency. Of course, you know, despite the fact these both of these projects are in Google, you aren't taking the AI tools and applying it in the real world systems because of the issues I've been talking about. You can't afford to fail at scale. You can't afford the, for these you know, unexpected risk uh, scenarios to crop up and lead to downtime on major Google systems. That's just not a, a headline or a situation uh, that you want to have happen. Uh, and so, you know, this, this puts a, a damper on applying these tools in these safety critical systems. And to make this sort of more concrete with a kind of smaller scale simulation that we put together in our group, which we'll come back to later, if you imagine, you know, a data center with on-site solar storage, uh, you know, energy storage uh, on-site solar, uh, and you use kind of a deep RL tool to predict uh, what to do. So the blue line is the sort of deep learning approach to predicting that and then adjusting your thing. Uh, the black line is a standard kind of robust optimization uh, based uh, benchmark. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is the average cost on the y-axis and the distribution shift between training and testing on the uh, x-axis. So this zero point is where you trained well on, on representative workloads. And so you can see that there is a you know, significant win from using the, the deep learning based tool uh, in that context. But of course, if there's distribution shift in practice and your training wasn't well tuned to deployment, all of a sudden now you see uh, the risk kick in. You see these massive uh, failure modes where if something goes off, uh, you can really suffer in your cost as a result of deploying these things. Uh, and so it's, it's this sort of different between you know big win if training is good big risk if something unexpected happens uh in terms of deployment uh that is you know underlying the challenge of deploying these things and what you really want is some sort of uh you know training tool that lets you take advantage of the situation when it's good but not suffer 
provides you guarantees in these situations where the training is bad. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the goal of the research direction and a lot of the projects we've been doing in various areas uh, in our group over the last few years is to try to obtain the guarantees you need uh, for safety critical applications, uh, but still get the benefits from these uh, uh, AI ML tools. Sorry. Okay, there we go. I turned off the ringer in the phone. Uh, okay, and so kind of as a as a caricature here, uh, when we look at this, the the way I just kind of describe kind of the world today is we have you know these black box tools that can get you good performance but suffer in terms of robustness safety, and then the more typical tools which are still getting you solid performance but have a gap compared to what's possible with AI tools, uh, but uh, can give you these robustness and safety guarantees uh, that you that you need for these systems, uh, and you know. The big picture question is, can you get to this point in the middle ground uh, where you get the best of both worlds? Uh, and so in the in the lingo, you know, of kind of control uh, or learning these days, this is sort of, you know, you have model based tools that you, you know, use to get these sort of guarantees, uh, but these more new, these newer model free uh, approaches can potentially lead to new performance improvements. Uh, and what you want is to combine model free and model based tools and, and this is sort of the uh, the driving question underlying, uh, or one of the driving questions underlying the emerging field of learning and control. Uh, and so if you're interested in this type of question, you're probably already aware, but there's a, a, new, a new very nice conference, L4DC, Learning for Dynamics and Control, uh, that, you know, can really give you, uh, you know, that with a lot of papers focused on this type of work, there's been a ton of workshops at the math institutes in recent years on this topic. And if you want an overview, we were just talking beforehand about this Control meets learning uh, virtual seminar series, which isn't going on anymore, but was a pandemic type virtual seminar series that has a number of talks online that can give you intros to, to this type of work. And, and broadly, you know, this, this field has led to a lot of new approaches uh, uh, that people have been fleshing out and building that try to get to that middle ground. Often these take, you know, some tool from control and mix it with some tool from learning uh, and try to, you know, in particular application contexts, get these guarantees, but still the performance improvements from the learning tools, whether that's, you know, mixing Lyapunov based techniques with policy learning things or mixing model free and model based in like policy search type settings or getting safety constraints on top of RL, uh, you know, lots of different interesting approaches in, the, in these sorts of directions. Uh, and then there's more learning based ones as well, where you take the learning tool itself and you do adversarial testing of it kind of like inspired by GANs or you do verification of it uh, inspired by kind of the uh, the model verification and and you know programming language community where you try to actually to verify the learning uh, in some sense with these sorts of these classical verification tools and so there's a bunch of different approaches that people have been using to try to get at this uh, but I'd say for the most part these uh, uh, approaches that I've listed here, at least, tend to focus on taking advantage of a particular, you know, AI framework or a particular control theoretic analysis uh, and combining those things in a particular setting. And one thing we've been thinking a lot about in our group is how to get more black box ways of combining model free and model based tools or control and you know learning tools uh, more broadly uh, and so that's what i'm going to talk about today is, is one approach that uh you know i think the generality of it and the black box nature of it i find really appealing uh and you know my goal i've been giving a version of this talk uh you know in a couple of different places over the last few months and my goal is really to try to uh convey not the specific results I'll talk about, but this idea of a black box way of combining model free and model based uh, to get the best of both worlds. Uh, and so hopefully the, the approach itself is what you take away rather than the specific results uh, today. Uh, and I, I, I refer to this as kind of a K experts approach for, for doing the combination. Uh, and the reason why I, I kind of refer to it that way is that uh, the idea is to, instead of paying any attention to how the AI tool or the control learning tool or the control online algorithms tool works, I'm just going to treat them as a black box expert, uh, where they present an, uh, you know, uh, an action to me. So they're going to say, you should follow this action. 
uh, and the, you know, the original, like the control online algorithms people that we're going to treat them as trusted experts, because that suggestion comes with a guarantee. If you, you if you always were to follow the trusted expert, you would get a, you know, worst case robustness guarantee for, for those actions. Uh, and that's something that's, you know, proven ahead of time. So, you know, you, that that guarantee exists. Whereas if you uh, follow the untrusted experts, which is like the AI tool, uh, there's no guarantee, but it often works really well. Uh, and so you have this untrusted expert and this trusted expert. You don't care how the experts are coming up with their advice, but you're taking that advice and you're combining them in some way. That's the algorithm we'll talk about, the how you do that combination. And that spits out an action that you actually follow. And the idea is that you want that action to have some guarantees, both with respect to robustness and performance. So that's the idea of the framework. Uh, and to make it really concrete for this talk, you can instantiate it in many different ways. Uh, but for this talk, we're going to be looking at this in a completely adversarial setting, uh, where the idea is that uh, you look in terms of what computer scientists call competitive ratio, which is the worst case sample path ratio of the costs. So you want uh, we want to have what's called consistency and robustness. And consistency means that we do as well as the black box AI when it does well. And so what I mean by that is on every you know, sample path, uh, the algorithm is within a one plus delta factor. Think of delta as small of what the cost of the untrusted uh, expert was uh, on that path. Uh, and so if the untrusted expert is terrible, this is a very weak bound and it's satisfied trivially. But if the untrusted expert is really good, this is a really tight bound. So if the untrusted expert is near optimal, this basically says you have to be near optimal, like one plus epsilon or one plus delta times optimal. Um, and so that's the thing that says we're doing, you know, good as good a performance as the AI tool was doing when it does well. But then we still want to maintain our robustness safety bound. And so for the talk, we'll use a robustness bound that says we're never more than a, a you know, gamma factor uh, times the offline optimal. What's the best thing that could have happened? Uh, and we want that competitive ratio is what it's called to be nearly as good as the competitive ratio that the trusted algorithm had initially. We expect there to be a trade-off because we're following the learning algorithm to do as well as the learning algorithm. So we shouldn't be able to be quite as good as the trusted algorithm was, but we wanna do kind of nearly as good, maybe within a constant factor or maybe with just a small degradation factor compared to it. Uh, and this is this trusted guarantee is the thing that's the key contrast to like the online learning K experts or multi arm banded literature, where we have this worst case uh, a priori proven guarantee on the trusted expert, and we want to kind of nearly maintain it while still mixing between the advice from the trusted and the trusted expert. So this is somehow a difference from the typical, you know, bandit style uh, bound where the arms don't come with guarantees or, or maybe they come with priors if you're thinking of the Bayesian sense, but still those are like stochastic type things. This is, you know, you have an adversarial worst case guarantee on every sample path for this trusted expert. And you want to maintain some version of that with the combination of your choices. Uh, so I'll take questions about this in just a second, but, you know, to, to make it really concrete. So if we think of like the control context, uh, model predictive control, put in this language, it has good consistency. You know, if your predictions are perfect and you're doing model predictive control, you get very good performance. But if your predictions are bad, you're terrible. Uh, and so you don't have robustness under, you know, classic model con con predictive control. And to make that really concrete, I'll come back to this example later. So think of a, this is a like drone trajectory tracking uh, problem. And so the dynamics are like a drone moving around and it doesn't know the path until, you know, the step ahead that it should follow. If you give it perfect predictions, you know, it does it really well. If you give it noisy predictions, NPC just isn't robust to that. Um, Okay, so this is a good time to take some questions about the framework. So if you want to, you know, just unmute or put something in the chat that I'll, I can clarify this sort of high level before we get into specific examples. Uh, Maria. Hi, I, uh, hi, Adam. Hi, it's good to see you. <laughs> to see you. I take it, you take it for granted that trusted expert actually guarantees the performance. And we have, uh, we have 
basically been spending all our time on <laughs> how do you actually make it make it uh, guaranteed when you know systems are changing and um, experts really don't know what's always going on in their system, in particular in networks and so forth. So that's right. And so, what is your ground truth? Basically, that's the question. Sorry, just a second. No, just go. I'm gonna talk. Uh, uh, yeah. So I think you're right. The uh, this the starting point here is that you have a system running that has a particular guarantee, uh, and you want to like answer the question of can you improve it with learning, and you want to keep that guarantee. So yeah, the, I, definitely. There's a whole other important question, which is if your system is changing underneath of you, and you want to learn it, and you want to be able to control and have guarantees. I'll actually come back to that a little bit at the end. But you know, in my picture here, that would say like. You know, if you don't even have the model uh, right. to do model based, then you're not ready to start applying this. And so this kind of is an application on top of that. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back. Actually, the, the first example we'll use actually is, is good for making progress on that problem, too. Um, but for, for 95 percent of this talk, imagine that, you know, you, you have a reasonable estimate of your model to start with. And this is on top of that. OK, thank you. Yeah. Other questions now? Yeah, uh, Rabab. Hi, Adam, great to see you again. Yeah, um, I did have a question actually on this side, so the metric mm -hmm. that you have. Um, one of the other things that we have a lot of times with model-based kind of decision-making, we have this sense of predictability. So if you kind of have a sense of what the input is, you have an idea of how that's going to perform. And you don't always have that with kind of these black box techniques and machine learning techniques. So when we're trying to implement it in the field, there's a lot of hesitancy because there's, I don't understand the details of it. Um, yeah. Is there a way to kind of fold that into the goals that you have within um, this framework? Um, or is that something that you had given some thought so I think you know the the this framework. The idea is you don't need to then fold it into the AI learning piece because you're getting it from combining with the model based. So so somehow like the the idea that the model based tool is you know capturing that uh, predictability as, as long as you trust the model based tool, uh, then you can be more aggressive with the learning tool in terms of taking advantage because it's got the safety net coming from combining it. You'll, you'll see like like in some sense the you know the idea is you take advantage of the the learning tool when it's good because of the consistency bound and you you know what you're combining with you want it to have a strong robustness bound and so that's where whatever if you can get that strong robustness bound you know maria's point is you can't always yet uh but if you can get that robustness bound then that's the like the safety net for you uh and so you can be more aggressive with the consistency uh side yeah perfect okay so uh i'll go on then but yeah please interrupt me throughout if there's more questions thank you for those two Oh, one more. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, if I understand this correctly, it's like a kind of like worst case minimax guarantee. Um, as I'm wondering, is it if, it, if that's a artifact of a analysis, or a, a, is in practice people actually prefer a worst case? Uh, yeah, in practice, I don't know. So I we definitely go after worst case in our group, uh, and I think this is because we're we're really motivated by uh, the safety critical aspect. So so we want there to be you know strong uh, safety guarantees that you will always, no matter what happens, stay within a region or always no matter what happens, you've got stability or your things won't blow up. So that, that tends to be our focus. Uh, the framework itself here, uh, you could certainly apply it to various stochastic or you know confidence interval type bounds. Uh, some other groups have have already started to work on bounds like that. Uh, so the framework, the idea, like the high level idea of what I'll talk about today, is you know you don't have to go about the worst case, but the results that I'll provide are all worst case. Uh, and I think in some application settings that is what you want. I, I certainly wouldn't claim that in all application settings that's what you want. It could be too conservative. Um, right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this this framework that I'm like I've uh, in a cartoon way introduced so far uh, is emerging, uh, you know, with a lot of attention in recent years. So it's uh, untrusted advice is the keyword if you're looking for titles and abstracts. Uh, and you know, it was introduced in kind of 2018 by Vasilis uh, and. 
you know, in the context of a, an online algorithm problem called online caching. Uh, and since then, it's kind of showed up in a wide variety of settings. Uh, actually, just in the last couple of weeks, a few more papers showed up on, on archive that I haven't added here yet. So uh, it's really, I think, growing quickly. These are the ones in our groups that, that we've been working on. Uh, and I'll talk about a subset of these today, uh, but I just want to make sure like it, it's really kind of a, uh, I think, exciting emerging area right now. And it's at that introductory area where, as you'll see, like, you know, we can start to say interesting things, but there's as many open questions as there are things where there have been results, uh, even in the applications where people have started to study it. Uh, so there's a lot of nice questions still in this area. Uh, and so because of that, my goal today isn't really to like, you know, Give you the full story on any specific application, uh, but it's to give you a sense for how algorithms work and how they're designed and what fundamental limits have been seen so far in the algorithmic approach to this problem. Uh, and so I'll kind of walk through at a high level some results and give you a flavor of how the algorithms work uh, and kind of bounce between applications a bit. Uh, as we go and and the first one uh, problem I'll talk about. Uh, actually, you know, and I, I, I maybe I'll, I'll say one more word here. So the the problems I'm choosing are, are meant to be like really clean, classical online algorithms problems. Uh, so you know, they're not a specific application problem, but I'll give you a sense for where they have been applied. Uh, they've all you know had nice power applications. So hopefully, you can find connections to them, even though they're kind of the crisp classical uh, uh, mathematical problems that I'm presenting. Um, and so the first one is, uh, I think, a really lovely problem. It's, it's convex body chasing. Uh, so if you haven't seen it before, it's very simple. It's you choose some points in a high dimensional space as the learner. Uh, and then the environment gives you a convex set. Uh, think of this as the safety set for your power system if you want. So this is the, you know, you need to choose your action uh, within this set to keep the system, you know, within viable limits. Uh, so you choose some point in that set. Uh, the cost you pay is the distance you move. So you, uh, and the idea here is that this captures often the idea that you don't wanna be changing your uh, system configuration dramatically from time to time, or from step to step every time. You want to kind of be smooth in the movements of your system configuration. Uh, and so, and then this happens again, you, you present it, there's a new safety body that shows up, you have to pick an action within that safety body, you pay the cost for your movement and so on. And so, you know, overall, your cost is just the uh, sum of your movements, uh, and you're always choosing uh, an action within the body that's uh, presented to you at a given time slot. Uh, what makes this challenging is that you don't know the future safety sets, and so you don't know where in the current body you should place yourself to, you know, be optimally configured to minimize your movement going forward, uh, and you know, that can be a big difference. Uh, and so as a result, the algorithms in this space tend to be conservative. You tend to kind of hedge by going somewhere near the center in some sense of the body uh, that's presented to you. And by staying somewhat near the center, uh, you're in a good situation, no matter what the adversary gives you as you, the next body for the next time step. Whereas if you were to be aggressive and go to one corner, since this is adversarial bounds that we're going after, the adversary could make you kind of regret moving towards one side versus the other. Okay, so that's the high level. Uh, and this has a very long history. So it's been looked at for you know over 40 years at this point and uh, across kind of online learning, online algorithms, uh, or operations research, uh, you know, areas. Uh, in recent years, uh, there's been some exciting connections to control and power. Uh, and so I put a few examples of papers from our group here. Uh, this last one in particular, we apply it in the context of, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll highlight, I'll refer back to Maria's question here. So we apply it here in the context of uh, voltage control where you don't know the network structure. So you don't know the topology of the grid, uh, and yet you're still able to do uh, stabilize uh, an unknown system uh, with convex body chasing. And the idea here in using it in sort of safety and stability applications is that you, uh, in a system that you don't know the dynamics of, or you don't know the topology of, uh, you start with a very large uncertainty set. Uh, and then as you run the system, uh, your uncertainty set about the model shrinks 
uh, and that uncertainty set is captured with your convex body. And so you, are, you have what's called a nested convex body chasing problem, where as you learn more information of the system, you're getting nested convex sets that shrink. Uh, and you know, you're using a controller that's robust to the size of the body at any given point. And so as the body shrinks, you can use a more aggressive controller. And so you can get stability, provable stability gains, guarantees with finite air bounds uh, using nested convex body chasing, even in unknown systems there. And so there's some very nice applications uh, that I can talk more about afterwards for those who are interested. Um, and then on the algorithmic side, there's been a lot of groups looking at this over the last few years with uh, kind of the state of the art result being due to Sebastian Bubeck and Mark Selke uh, and others, uh, which basically point to the fact that uh, the Steiner point is the right way of thinking about the center of these sets uh, if you want to be, you know, get these robust competitive bounds. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you always move to the Steiner point of the body, you can get a bound that is linear in D, which is the dimension of the space that you're in, uh, or nearly square root D with this log T annoying factor. Uh, and the best you can possibly hope to do is square root D. And so, you know, our best algorithms are, are linear uh, in this context, and they are simple to state, just follow the Steiner point of the sets as they come to you. Uh, but, you know, as I said, this is very conservative. You're always moving to the center of the sets. If you had a learning algorithm that could, could predict what's coming, you could do much better. And so, you know, to illustrate that, if we go back to our example, uh, you know, if you're always moving to the Steiner point, uh, you're, you know, hanging out there. Whereas if you knew what was coming, you could move to this point here and then just stay there the whole time and have it be in all three sets and you'd have a very small movement cost compared to this uh, you know big movement cost of always following the centers uh, of course if your advice was bad uh, you know it could really screw you over and you could be you know way out here each time uh, and so this is exactly robustness and consistency you want to have uh, the ability to follow the advice when it's good but the ability to hedge and not be not suffer dramatically if your learning uh, is just way off for whatever reason. Um, and so, you know, the this gets at the what is then the core algorithmic question in this domain, which is when should you follow the trusted advice versus the untrusted advice? And you know, is it enough to just always follow one or the other, or do you need to hedge between them? Uh, and so, the starting point, you know, in this is is always these switching algorithms, which we, is what we call them, where you always you follow one or the other and you kind of switch between. And, th and this is very natural, right? If you, if you think about what you might approach this problem as, you start by following your AI uh, algorithm, uh, your, the advice coming from your untrusted expert. Uh, and then at some point, if it, trues that it proves that it's not trustworthy, you stop following it. Uh, and then you follow the trusted algorithm. And as long as you haven't followed the untrusted one too long, it doesn't hurt you that much. Uh, but of course, then if it starts to be really great after you switch away from it, that's a bad idea. So you wanna keep checking in on it, basically to see if it has now learned enough that it's good. Uh, and so this uh, in the online language, algorithms lingo is a doubling algorithm where you follow one for a particular cost R uh, and then follow the other for a particular cost R. Uh, so you've incurred two R costs by the end of step two, uh, and then repeat. And this is nice because, you know, if the untrusted advice is really good, it'll take you a long time to take up R cost compared to the trusted advice. If it's really bad, it'll take you a very short time to incur R cost compared to what the trusted advice will take to incur it. Uh, and so you're spending more or less time in the one that's better by having this sort of threshold thing. And you're kind of always repeating back, but by doubling each time when you repeat back, uh, you make sure that you don't kind of suffer too much compared to the cost you've already incurred, which keeps your approximation ratio small. Uh, and so the doubling trick works reasonably well here. So this is you know, a very simple classical algorithms framework that can be applied here uh, to kind of optimize it. Uh, I guess maybe one thing to highlight is, you know, this is treating the advice as black box. I don't care whether you're doing deep learning or RL or whatever you're doing for your untrusted advice. I don't care if it's learning online during the instance or if you trained it ahead of time and then deployed it, you know, whatever you do, it's all captured by this. Uh, and I don't care about your trusted advice either, whatever tools you're using. Uh, and then, you know, to make this more sophisticated and actually get good bounds, you can't just use R and R. 
You want to choose those things uh, appropriately and often adaptively so that you uh, adapt how long you're spending in each one, depending on what you've seen as the observed quality of the algorithms in the instance. Uh, and so that becomes a bit more complicated. But with this style of algorithm, the simple style, you can already in the nested case uh, get a very nice bound. So nested is worth emphasizing here, um, but you get a bound that is kind of a what you hope for with this type of analysis, which says that you're one plus delta consistent and D over delta robust. And so if we think of this in the context of the background I gave you, this means that we've given up a one over delta factor, so a constant factor compared to the best robustness guarantee known, the order D from the Steiner point algorithm. Uh, and with that trade-off, we are as good up to an arbitrary delta factor as the black box AI was. So we can give up very little compared to what the black box was doing, but we get a provable adversarial worst case bound uh, with no assumptions uh, on our you know, deep RL, if that's what we're applying, uh, which is something that you, know, you don't get for these types of tools typically. So I think this is this is the big win is you know you get a provable adversarial robust bound uh, for something where you you know don't normally get any bounds give me any guarantees for how it's going to work uh, and you do it without giving much up in terms of performance. Go I for just it, have a quick question here. Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, expected that like the robustness depends like inversely on delta? Uh, it, I don't know if at this point almost all of our results do uh, one over delta test has tended to be our goal but it's I don't know I don't know if that's best that could be a function of our algorithms um, okay. we do have I, as I get going I'll show you some lower bounds so in some contexts we can prove lower bounds it's not always one over delta uh, sometimes it's worse than that sometimes there's a you know worse dependency so I think it you know in general it will depend on the application. Uh, but one over delta is pr a pretty common like target, uh, I'd say. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So good. So this is the nested case. Of course, we want to move beyond the nested case, and unfortunately, you know, this gets us to our first fundamental limit. So here, uh, with switching algorithms, you can show that if you want to be robust to any factor, not just like a one over delta constant, but you want any non-infinite competitive ratio, uh, then you have to be at least three consistent. And that's not ideal, right? That means you're giving up a factor of three performance compared to your AI tool in order to get any worst case bound uh, on its performance. Uh, so that's, you know, problematic. Uh, and that's, but that's for switching algorithms. And so this is what pushes us to go beyond switching algorithms to something that's more complex and how you combine these two forms of advice. And so here, the uh, way we'll be a little bit more sophisticated, still simple, uh, is that we'll just take the convex combination of the two advice points. So here the blue is, uh, sorry, the blue is the trusted algorithm. The green is the untrusted. The hat is, uh, you know, the untrusted. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take a convex combination, but we'll do this adaptively by kind of moving more or less towards the trusted advice from the untrusted advice, depending on the costs we've experienced from each algorithm over the runtime so far. And so here, you know, this is a, now a line chasing problem. So you're never actually moving anywhere on the, in the set beyond the line. And so you're chasing a line and you're chasing it, trying to be competitive with the endpoints of the line. Uh, and you know, if the trusted algorithm is doing better than the untrusted, so you know, this is the cost T is like the running cost up to time T, uh, then you just follow the trusted advice because you're getting you know both guarantees for free. Otherwise, uh, you know, follow the untrusted uh, and then take a step towards it. And I'm not putting down the exact formula because it's long and messy. Uh, and it's not you know, it doesn't provide that much intuition, but there's you know now a somewhat complex way of determining based on the historical costs how far you go. And you know, intuitively it does exactly what you expect. If if your cost is close together, you're way out here. If you're if the trust uh, untrusted is much better, you're really following it more closely. Uh, but you really adaptively determine where you want to be in between. Uh, and with this kind of, and again the key thing is you know we're not making any reference to how these algorithms are working. So this is really black box. Uh, it applies to whatever complex 
form of you know AI tool or combination of AI tools that you're using to do this and whatever your AI algorithm is, as long as it has a guarantee. Uh, and the guarantee does play a role in uh, this adaptivity. Uh, so you are using that kind of competitive ratio that you proved a priori. And here now you can get beyond the three consistent thing, but you can't get, or at least uh, we can't get uh, yet all the way down to one plus delta. So uh, we're getting a root two plus delta consistency factor. So that's reasonably good. You're, you're giving up some compared to the black box AI, but you know it's not getting exactly the same performance. And now that delta, again, the best we've been able to get is a delta squared dependency in this case. And here we don't have a lower matching lower bound. Uh, and so like, it's a really interesting question to understand, you know, is the robustness trade-off here, you know, that, that not getting one plus delta, is it a function of our algorithm or uh, is there some fundamental limit on what you can do uh, in this context? Uh, we don't really know yet. And the same goes for the delta squared. Uh, and so there's some nice open problems here. Um, Okay, but the, the key thing I wanted to get across there was, uh, you know, that there are nice open problems, but also that, you know, switching is not always enough. You have to be a little bit more complex in your algorithms if you want to get, uh, you know, full, uh, fully exploit uh, the AI tool. Uh, and the other thing I want to highlight is because we're being adaptive, we're using the running cost of both algorithms. We're using a lot of memory uh, in order to understand whether to follow the advice or hedge and how much to hedge. Uh, and so a nice question, also a fundamental question, is sort of how much memory and is needed, and in particular, is memory needed at all uh, to get benefit from these you know, untrusted advice tools to get these robustness versus consistency guarantees. And so to give some insight in that, we'll go to a slightly different problem. There actually is a reduction between these two problems, so they, they aren't really that different. Um, but uh, you know, this, it's a little easier to think about here. And this, this is a problem that's seen a lot of application and power. Uh, and so here, instead of giving you a convex body at each round, uh, the environment gives you a convex cost function and you pay your cost on that cost function, which I call a hitting cost. Uh, and then you also pay this movement or switching cost uh, for how much you're going. Uh, and so again, you know, get a new cost function, you pay your cost, you pay your movement and so on. Uh, and so now instead of just having your movement cost, like in convex body chasing, you additionally have a hitting cost for how much cost you incur for your action, for your system configuration at that round. Um, and there's some nice reductions here to uh, LQR control and even some nonlinear control models. Uh, so even though there's not dynamics explicitly stated here, uh, you can capture dynamics in this setting very easily with particular choices of cost functions and movement costs. And so the, the key thing here is, you know, how do you decide uh, when to switch without knowing the future? Uh, same thing as before. Uh, and, you know, like before, there's lots of uh, interesting applications uh, in energy and control. Uh, this one in particular is some, something that we've been looking at in our group for over a decade now. Uh, and it's been a really fun problem because we've been able to get kind of industry deployments of algorithms from this uh, context in data centers with partner with UMass and video streaming uh, and EV charging uh, it underlies algorithms that was in uh, Stephen Lowe's startup in this space. Uh, and then Yisong, a collaborator here at Caltech has also deployed it in like camera tracking. So uh, in NBA, the camera tracking players hear the, you know, the hitting cost is how where the ball is on the screen to try to keep it near the center and the movement cost avoids kind of the shaky cam uh, moving to, you know, too much in each given step to go back and forth. So there's a lot of really fun applications of algorithms in this domain. Um, and again, there's, you know, because of the applications, there've been tons of algorithmic progress. Uh, and at this point, kind of a state of the art looks something like this, where you take advantage of some structure in the cost functions. And so think of them, you know, a, a common choice is alpha polyhedral, so that there's some envelope uh, with slope alpha that the cost function lives within. Uh, and in that context, you can handle both convex and non-convex cost functions. Uh, and so in the convex case, there are some algorithms that don't use memory, since we're talking about memory, but that are memoryless that can get to a like root alpha, one of a root alpha competitive uh, bound. Whereas in the non-convex case, you're a little worse, you're one over alpha order uh, for your competitive bound. And the algorithms actually have to be very simple in the non-convex case. So it just is a greedy, like move to the minimizer style algorithm that has the best guarantee in that context. 
Um, so lots of nice work. Uh, and there's other contexts as well besides the alpha polyhedral, but uh, it's a good, good enough uh, illustration for now. And again, you know, here the algorithms, as the second one highlights, have to be pretty conservative because you know, if you don't move to the minimizer, then it, the adversary can punish you in the non-convex case pretty badly for being near the minimizer but not at it. Uh, and so the algorithms end up being conservative and advice can help a lot, right? If you're always moving near the minimizer, uh, then you are chasing these functions around, whereas the advice can potentially avoid a lot of movement cost by staying, you know, where staying put instead of chasing a minimizer when the slope is small. Uh, but of, you know, like before, if the advice is bad, you can really pay a huge cost in movement because you think you are capturing something that's going to happen and it doesn't actually happen like you predicted it. And so, you know, here, uh, starting point again is switching algorithms. And uh, I guess coming back to the question that one over delta gets much worse in this case. So here you can be very good in terms of consistency. We ju I just put the two there to make the right side a little bit simpler, uh, but you get one plus two delta consistency. Uh, and now though you have a uh, exponential dependency on delta in terms of your robustness guarantee. So this is still a constant, but it's, you know, if you want to be really good in terms of tracking what the black box AI is doing, you pay exponentially in your uh, worst case adversarial bound. Uh, and this is joint work with Nico, Don, and Deb. Uh, and so here, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, in the first case, switching algorithms weren't enough to get full benefit here because we're looking at the non-convex case. If the function is non-convex, uh, you can have, you know, these local extrema, uh, and you can prove that you can't do better with non-switching algorithms than switching algorithms, uh, because the non-convexity can, you know, make you suffer if you try to hedge between algorithm or between the choices, for example. Uh, and so in a non-convex case, you can't do better with the more sophisticated. In the convex case, you can, uh, with, you know, non-switching algorithms, adaptive hedging, uh, do better, and you can get rid of that exponential dependency. Um, but in the, con in the the non-convex case, you need that dependency. Um, but you know, this is now a pretty strong result. It says, you know, I don't care about convexity, non-convex cost functions. I can still get, you know, a worst case robustness bound on top of your favorite form of deep learning or RL uh, for free almost. Uh, and yeah, I already said this exponential trade-off is unfortunate. Unfortunately, you know, it's necessary. Uh, you can prove a lower bound saying that for any online algorithm in the non-convex setting, you have to suffer uh, an exponential cost. The constant could be better, but this sort of exponential dependency is necessary. Um, and you know, now I want to come back to you know actually showing some of the deployment of these things. So this algorithm now applied in this sustainable data center context where we're controlling uh, electricity storage and uh, workloads to move to follow uh, you know wind and sun. Uh, we take this algorithm, this AOS adaptive switching algorithm. Uh, we combine it with the deep learning tool that was you, you know we I showed you on the plot before. So this was that plot from the beginning where we had. The, you know, the deep learning tool does well if there's no distribution shift, but does terrible if there's distribution shift. Uh, you take this AOS algorithm, you get exactly the goal. Uh, so that exponential worst case bound turns out to be loose uh, in terms of the practical deployment. And you get almost no suffering from distribution shift because the online algorithm saves you uh, and you get you know, nearly the full win uh, from the AI tool when it's trained well. Uh, and so this is, you know, really nice. And it's, you know, a simple switching algorithm, just choosing one or the other in an adaptive way, bouncing back and forth uh, that, you know, you layer on top of whatever you're already doing in your system for, uh, you know, your robust algorithm and whatever AI tool you want on top. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, very practically deployable uh, on top of these systems. But uh, I'm cherry peeking here. I'm choosing the best of the lines for a different delta. So the delta recall is that like one plus delta guarantee. So that's something you have to prove, you have to assign ahead of time in your algorithm. How much do you want to try to track the AI versus 
how good you want your robustness bound to be. Uh, and so, you know, you can experiment, of course, in simulation and try to set it. Um, but, you know, if you set it wrong, you can still pay a price uh, or give up some cost here, right? If you want the, if you set it too large, then you're giving up your consistency guarantee. If you set it too small, then you're not getting as good a robustness guarantee. Uh, and so there's a key challenge left from after this theorem, which is how to set that confidence in the advice, that delta parameter, uh, so that you get the best balance. Uh, and you know this is an open question in the both the body chasing and the online optimization context, but we've made progress on it in the LQR context, in the linear quadratic control context. And so in the in that context, we have you know similar algorithms about adaptive switching and and uh, you know things like that. I won't show you the those results because there we can take uh, a layer on top and we can prove a bound that looks like this. I'm just going to do it really quickly. Uh, but basically there, if you take a follow the leader approach from the like bandits uh, experts uh, online learning community, uh, really follow the regularized leader approach uh, to learning Delta online, uh, then you get a guarantee of a different sort of form where you get a one plus you know, an epsilon over one plus epsilon type bound with a variation parameter. And the key thing here is there's no delta anymore because you've learned it adaptively. And instead, the bound depends on the experienced error on that instance of the, you know, untrusted advice. Uh, and so it depends on how much variation there is in that and how much error. But, you know, it's a little hard to see from this form what that means in practice is that you're following the lower envelope of all of these. So the performance you get is the lower envelope of any delta. Uh, and I didn't get a chance to add that plot, I should, but uh, you basically you end up with the lower envelope. And so you get a best of all worlds in the LQR setting uh, from this follow the leader approach wrapped on top of the algorithm style that I've talked about. Um, Okay, and so you know to show that one in practice, this was the you know, like the drone tracking, the drone trajectory tracking problem before. Uh, this is now taking again the you know the deep learning approach to predictions, wrapping our algorithm on top. Uh, you know, and and here I you know really emphasized it, so I add really really nasty predictions for MPC, uh, and you can see you know MP, our algorithm it does suffer occasionally, like there's a little bit of missing in the beginning uh, because of the the air bound but it's really able to adapt and be completely robust uh, to the you know, terrible predictions uh, coming from the you know, algorithm. And of course, it still works very well if, they're, if the predictions are good. Uh, so I'm showing the hardest case here. Um, Okay, but so, so that's the demo, two, two little demonstrations in you know simple uh, practical simulation type environments. But I wanted to talk about memory here, and so the point of all of that in terms of memory is that uh, we have a memoryless algorithm that works very well. Uh, we're using memory to be adaptive in these online switching algorithms that I just showed you. Uh, do we need that memory? And here again, we can prove a, a fundamental limit that says. It's even stronger than than we kind of initially thought it would be. It says that basically you can't get a guarantee better uh, than you had for an algorithm that didn't use any predictions at all, unless you use memory. So you know more concretely, if you're in the two dimensional case and above, uh, even in convex settings, so you know, drop the non convexity. Uh, then a memoryless algorithm cannot have a constant robustness bound while also having a consistency bound better than the one over root alpha. And remember I said that in this convex setting, you could get one over root alpha with an algorithm that's memoryless and doesn't look at predictions at all. And so using, like if you wanna get any benefit at all from the predictions, uh, you have to use memory because otherwise the guarantee is no better than what you could have had without using uh, predictions at all. Uh, just a quick question. Um, so the lower bound doesn't capture like the trade-off between gamma and delta. No, nope, because it says for any gamma, any oh, any finite it's gamma. It's actually stronger. Oh, I yeah. see. It's very strong. I see. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So it's very strong in the sense that I don't care what the trade-off is. No trade-off is possible uh, if you don't use memory. Um, but this doesn't say how much memory you need. Like maybe you can get away with very small amounts of memory. So it's, it doesn't say anything about that. Um, 
And, you know, there are certainly some cases where you can get away without memory. And so, you know, this requires you to be in at least two dimensions. Uh, in the one dimensional case, uh, you can uh, benefit from, you know, you, you can get away without memory. Uh, and so in that case, we did come up with an algorithm that gets, you know, a very nice trade off between consistency and robustness. This delta squared is a little annoying. I, I really think it should be one over delta. It would be nice to improve this algorithm to get that. Um, but, you know, in this case, uh, you really are able to get away without memory. And the one dimensional case, it may seem simple, given that I've been talking about high dimension. I'll get to you in a second, Maria. But, you know, it, it's very useful. There's been, you know, doesn't, you know, quite a large number of applications uh, of the one dimensional case, for example, in data centers and other contexts where, uh, and the EV context as well, uh, where you, you, it's really a low dimensional space. Uh, and so this is a useful problem. Go for it, Maria. I just was curious um, for uncertainties that are Marco models. Yep. Do you have any estimates of how much memory would be needed? Is it just because it's such a simple process, you just have to know something, you know, one step before. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what is a sort of the generate case for because a lot of things we can model in power systems as Markov processes. So yeah, great question, and I have no intelligent answer. Maybe and I'll follow up on that with you because I have a student working on that a little bit. That would be great. Okay. I mean, so so all of our results, especially all the lower bounds, are definitely in the adversarial context. So we are we have not allowed ourselves to take advantage of Markov or stochastic structure for the advice. You know, our our, our goal is really to say you know because we're, we're thinking of the advice not as coming from like a predictor and some stochastic thing with guarantees but coming from some you know model free black box ai that could make really weird unpredictable errors uh and so we we really want the advice error to be adversarial that's kind of uh, a key pillar uh, of the approach is we don't want to make any assumptions I, I guess what i'm thinking is like you know, advice can be priced from the market. You worked a lot yeah. in the markets. And then the agents just learn with that advice, which is very structured. Yeah. So, so I think that's a great question. And, and I think, you know, the framework is, it's, it'll be really nice to see people take okay. it to these more stochastic settings. On that. Let's follow up. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. And I'm, I'm sort of wrapping up at this point. So like that, that's the last result I want to say. And now I want to kind of get to some of these things like, you know, what, what's next. So, my, my goal was to really highlight this framework. Uh, so even if you the results or the particular models aren't you know right up to you, hopefully the idea of applying this framework to get worst case bounds for you know black box AI tools is is appealing. Uh, you know in terms of questions we talked about in this talk, really it was kind of algorithmic questions like how much sophistication do you need in your algorithm? to be able to get these, you know, worst case bounds for black for untrusted experts. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of open questions. The one I hinted at we, where we have, a, we have a first kind of baby result in the uh, LQR setting is to say, you know, how do you adapt to the quality of these untrusted experts? A really nice one uh, that is sort of along the lines of what Maria was just talking about is, you know, suppose you have some sort of uncertainty quantification for your untrusted expert, how do you take advantage of that? You should be able to use that information and, and Markov would be one form of that, but you could just have confidence intervals. You could have some sort of range bound. You could have lots of ways of sort of quantifying uncertainty. And there's a lot of work in you know, uh, RL and uh, deep learning communities to try to you know, give estimates with uncertainty quantification. So if you have that as your input, what, what power does that give you in terms of combining trusted and untrusted experts? Um, and then, uh, you know, having multiple experts with multiple guarantees is something I'm really interested in. So suppose you have, you know, uh, an expert that guarantees stability, an expert that guarantees robustness, an expert that guarantees safety, and these are different trusted experts. Can you combine them uh, with an untrusted expert and get all of the guarantees and still have consistency in our language? Uh, that's, I think, a really big, maybe the, maybe the big direction uh, for this. And then, you know, coming again back to Maria's point at the beginning, which is, you know, the starting point for this talk was we have a trusted expert, but if you need to learn the model to be able to have a trusted expert, how do you build that model learning piece into this framework? And, and we, this is something we, we have now uh, a line of papers looking at, not, not yet connecting it with this trusted, untrusted expert framework, but with the idea of 
learning as you control a system. So, you know, st provably stabilizing an unknown system, for example. Uh, and so to give you a hint, you know, a, a, a one second advertisement for a paper that uh, just went on archive. Uh, so this is an example of applying convex body chasing in voltage control of an unknown topology. And so you take standard approaches for doing this based on like system ID and then control. That's what's shown in the blue. So you get massive. So here, the, this is the voltage type thing. The dotted lines are your limits. You want to keep your system stabilized within the limits. So if you apply system ID approaches, like generic ones, uh, they just can't stabilize an unknown system quick enough to be able to respond. It's just you're, you're dead in the water. Uh, but if you take this uh, CMC as consistent model chasing, so it's applying convex body chasing in this way to keep a consistent set of what, what models could explain the data you've seen and rather than trying to learn the system perfectly, you just try to learn the system enough for that your for your robust controller to be able to keep you stabilized. Uh, then that's the yellow line, and so you can see the yellow line. Each is a different sort of line limit, and so they're all being stabilized uh, within the system. They're all staying in the limits, even though you're starting with zero information about the topology of the network and its line limits. Uh, and they're online on a simple path, being able to be kept stabilized. Uh, with these tools, uh, so that's you know I'm not giving you any of the details, and I you know I'm hopefully uh, hopefully I'm just getting you to read the paper. But Maria, question. I sorry, I had too much coffee this morning. So, <laughs> uh, so you know I worked a lot in voltage problem early on, and so if you have these voltages within certain limits, right? And uh, and what can happen, and uh, this is what happens with the blackouts in power systems that. Um, Actually, even within the limits, the, the monotonicity of the response changes. You know, you go through the bifurcation yeah. point. And that is the sort of classic example of blackouts. How do you differentiate in this approach between the limits within which you are looking for and, uh, you know, the sort of qualitative response that you are predicting that may change? Because so, you so take this as a, like, very uh, first step at this. So we're not capturing everything. Uh, so for this situation, we're just trying to keep it stabilized within the limits. We're not looking at the more fine grained stuff. So so that's the follow up work. But uh, to, stabilize, to stabilize within the limits around the bifurcation, you have to change the control law. So yeah, exactly. Do this with this yeah, so yeah, we're doing that with just like this is the standard, uh, mo like sort of model standard, uh, like constraints on it. So this this is satisfying like all the you know standard theory, uh, constraints that people use for the voltage control problem. I'll show you. I'll send you the paper right after. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So, but but you know, don't expect it to be the perfect uh, practical limits. This is like the typical theory model. Uh, 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 right, uh, uh, right uh, at time, so, right? So yes. I think that's my last slide. So thank you. Like I said, the goal is to get you to think about the framework. And here are some papers uh, in case you want to follow up uh, and you know look at the details since I didn't give you many details today. Uh, thanks a lot for, for all the questions. It's really fun when there's questions throughout. Yeah, uh, thank you, Atom. I, I think we can still spend maybe one or two minutes more, take one or two questions from the audience who didn't have a chance to ask a question. Adam, um, thanks yes. uh, for the nice talk. I'll, uh, I just took a question from an informed perspective actually here. So although your algorithms are essentially, uh, well, they, they assume there is this uh, online component. And I wonder whether you have thought uh, whether those uh, techniques can also be applied in an offline setting. So think where you have just a black box predictor uh, takes input data, you have a a prediction, uh, like in a super physical system, for example, uh, we're also interested in satisfying certain properties, uh, mm -hmm. like being in a uh, confidence region or satisfying some constraints. So, is there any hope to leverage some of the work that you have done here? Interesting. I. My first instinct is, instinct is no, <laughs> which is probably not the answer you're looking for. But my first instinct is. The, you know, the, the adaptivity of what we're doing really depends on, you know, seeing the output of a choice, responding to it, adjusting. Uh, so 
maybe that could be done during the training phase. Uh, and maybe that's the like way to think about it, but yeah. that's crucial. So there, there would have to be some way of capturing that kind of response uh, and update. And, you know, so that like, so the, the sort of black boxness of it that we're applying in the online context maybe would be lost there because now you're doing it during the training phase, which means you have to integrate it into whatever you're doing uh, otherwise for training in your algorithm, or you have to separate it. And then is it really a good idea to lose that data from the training phase for your like AI tool? So there seem to be like a lot of complex issues there if you were to try to take it offline in that context. But I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, it's, I don't see it as impossible, but it, it's, it doesn't seem like, you know, a, a one day on the whiteboard thing either. Uh, it makes sense. Thanks. Yes, I think, I mean, it, there's probably a relation with uh, interpolation and extrapolation here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. So more, more questions? All right. I think, I think we're good. Uh, thank yeah, you. there were lots of questions. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank it was you, a fun everybody. talk. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. I'll follow up, Maria. Okay.